Strategic Hot Box with Dr. Brandy Love Stankovic. Discussing leadership, business, and how to take control of your life and achieve greatness. From the streets of Las Vegas, energized, informed, and never diluted. It's time to kick some ass. Welcome back to the Strategic Hot Box. It's your girl, Dr. Brandy Stankovic. I am so excited to be here. We have a very special guest with us today that's going to help us dig into how to make history relevant and what we can learn about the past, how we can bring it into the future, how we can dig in and get delicious and get dirty, maybe a little, get all dirty with it, and learn about those that have come before, respect it, learn from it, and build on it. So let's get started. As you know, the Strategic Hot Box is built into three uh, sections. I feel like it's become part of our mantra, our philosophy. It's the learn, the love, and the kick ass. In the learn section, we give us some new tools. We talk to you. We speak, you know, give you anything that you need to, to take from here and make something happen and dig into some different topics. And today, that's going to be a little bit about history and legacy and how we can learn from those that came before us. And then the love section, we'll talk about relationships relationships and the importance of history to relationships. We'll get to know Dale and some of the journeys that he has been on all over the world. And then in the kick-ass, of course, my favorite part, your favorite part, I'm going to give you some kick-ass things that you can start making happen today. So when it comes to history, we've talked about legacy on this podcast. We've talked about respecting those that have come before us. And I even have a quote that I want to share with you today. And that is, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And George Santayana, I should probably have looked up how to exactly say that quote before I like look up so many different things. But regardless, it's a very important quote. And I think that it really speaks to the fact that those who cannot remember or even understand, build and absorb the past are going to repeat the mistakes that we've made in the past or are going to look silly into the future. Right, because you are not building on what came before. And one of the things that uh, Dale's father and you shared in the show, and we'll learn from Dale uh, here in a few minutes, but if you really want to know someone, you have to know where they came from, right? And he shared that, and we'll learn more about that. But it's so true. If you don't understand where people are from, where organizations are from, the history of projects, then you really don't know those projects or those organizations. I have a good friend, John Allen. So shout out to John from San Diego Firemen's Relief Association. And he always, he has this, this, process called the 30 seconds of feedback, where anytime he comes into an organization or he comes into a meeting, comes into a problem, one of his employees comes to him and says, I have a problem. He says, give me 30 seconds of context. I want to know the background of what's happening before you build me into what's happening here or where you want me to make a decision in the future. And that's powerful. Give me some update of what's happening so I can get a bigger picture, a strategic view of what's happening. And I really think that in from a strategic planning sense, from, you know, knowing a foundation from building goals, you have to know the why behind decisions that were made in the past, even if they were bad decisions. Most of the time, leaders, most of the time, human beings don't sit around going, well, how can we screw up today? I mean, sometimes we do on like a good Friday night, right? After a couple shots, I sometimes will look to, to cause trouble. But most of the time, organizations go into it with some sort of intent. They, they intended on doing things the right way. Now, it may have been based on bad knowledge. It may have been based on, on emotion. You know, there could have been things that came into play. But it's important to know what those things were in order to be able to correctly make an informed decision going forward. The history of the players, the relationships, any shared experiences that happen. And the first thing that anybody does in crisis management, if you think about it, um, or planning or goal setting or anything really is a situational analysis. So where we are right now, how do we get here and what do we need to know? Right. So there, and I think the final thought on this before we transition and talk to Dale is the fact that there's rarely original thought. There's rarely a new thought. So people will come up and say, I've got this brand new idea. And most of the time, people that think they're always right or think that they have brand new ideas are people that aren't looking for ideas elsewhere. And we have information at our fingertips so much. And I can't wait to dig into Dale's experience when it comes to education. But I know, and I've shared with you on the podcast before, my entire doctoral process was about teaching me how not smart I am. 
and about teaching me that there's so much more information out there that I need to be constantly seeking and going after. And that's what life is all about, is the fact that there are there is knowledge based on knowledge, built on knowledge for years and years and years and years. And it's amazing to think about that and to absorb into it, to look into it, and then build an informed decision going forward. And we have so many opportunities to learn about the nuances of people, culture, and the romance of what came before. And I think there's no one better to help us in this journey than Dale Simpson Jr. You have your bachelor's in anthropology and geography. You've got a master's in anthropology and archaeology. You're in the process and almost there with your doctorate and maybe almost have it in archaeology. And you've gotten those from Canada and from Australia and from all over the world. You were the host on Found on the History Channel. Very cool show for anybody that hasn't seen that episode. And you're you worked on your PhD on Easter Island, I mean, which is so amazing. Analyzed tools to make the Moai mm. and, and, and the famous Easter Island statues. Give it a Google if you don't know what that is. And you're an instructor of the College of DuPage and the Malcolm X College. And you speak three languages. Say something. Say hello to us in your three languages. I'll say uh, good day. Hola. Como estamos? Irana Corua. Pejera. I thought maybe in English you'd say, yo. Yo, what up? (laughs) Does that work? Yo. That's that's the formal, you know, English language. Is that the Vegas chatter? You just say, yo, what up? Yo. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad we finally got to get together face to face and have a chat over this this system here. But, you know, before we go, I just want to do one thing that you brought up about respect. Some I learned in Australia. What you do is before you start any meeting or sort of discussion, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, both uh-huh. past and present, especially the Southern Paute, which are from this area. Mm-hmm. But just keep in mind that you know Native Amer- we're in Native American Awareness Month, and it's really important to see these first ancestors that were here, you know, ten thousand, fifteen thousand years ago, up to the groups that are living till today. So we want to go back in long term history. These are the groups that I'd like to acknowledge today. Excellent. I was hoping that it wasn't going to include some sort of like ritual well that we can you do were... that later let's, let's get those three shots <laughs> off camera go. ritual yeah. is going yeah, to yeah, it. <laughs> that's right no 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 rituals just enough to I, I always like to give respect first and i think that's Absolutely. those are the groups that come before us and these that's why we're here today i love that and i'm so intrigued by all the journeys that you've had tell us a little bit about your journey oh my journeys okay uh well i think some of it is the one of the highlights i always start with in my life is the more you see other cultures, the better you understand your own. It's it's a very so simple. True, it's so it? simple. It's a very simple thing. You know, when you, you go to another place and see why someone eats this instead of that. Mm-hmm. Simple things. Now, whether we're in Vegas, we see tons of cultures and languages and we sit down and it's just great to people watch. Yeah. But when you come down to the, the bare tax of it, we all need to eat. We're all looking to have a good time. We want some good music. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to uh, experience things that we've never done before. It's very human in all of us. So I love coming to new places and just, uh, you know, asking those questions. You said the who, what, why, where, when, how. Mm-hmm. That's why I go by the who, what, why, when, how. Did you do that enough about that culture you're participating in? So the journeys are, are based in that. And then mm-hmm. my father, as a police officer, just really always practiced sort of you know, cultural relativity, really mm-hmm. understand about that culture before you make an interpretation. Or judgment, sure. And, and that was the, the greatest thing from my father. My mom is a genealogist where she really? studies the, the ground and the paper trail. I study the dirt trail. Wow. So she really slowly gave me sort of a background. Of how do you look at the past? What are you looking for? Mm-hmm. So we're both looking at uh, some things and people and events and artifacts from the past, but we use different records. Sure. But our goal is the same. It so is. So between my parents and then boys, Scouts and Cub Scouts. I mean, that was, I think that we, I would love to see a resurgence in the Scouts in the United States. I think it was something, you know, till today, a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverend. You know, where that is living inside your know. brain. I don't know. I don't ask me to do that again. I just, gosh, do you have your badge, like gosh. your sash on under I, that I, sweatshirt? I should. I should. I got, I got my pocket blade. That's all I carry. So I, I'm all right there in a flashlight. But, you know, literally, I live by those things today trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave clean and reverend maybe That's not the great. rev not the reverend place as much i, I can well not in vegas I, yeah <laughs> this is sin city so I, I, yeah stays in vegas that type of stuff so trips are around you know that idea of finding uh, new culture new places the influence of my parents boy scouts cub scouts and then last me my education mm-hmm. uh, and then i luckily had a wrestling scholarship to go to canada and that was really awesome because i was living in another country i yeah. was seeing how these individuals make their society 
Sure. What's the difference of having 330 million versus 33 million? Sure. Looking at demography, understanding those those little subtle differences and how that influences economy and politics. Did you and just so say far. demography? Yes. Tell me what that term is. So just studying population numbers, mm-hmm. how much people live in an area make a big difference. Mm-hmm. So I want to know how many people are here in Vegas. Someone's a little more than a million. You know, in right. Chicago, we got a little more than three million. Mm-hmm. New York, the largest. And then world cities, too. I like just they're great. They're great trivia questions. Do you trivia nights? Yes. There's always up I'm there sure you're a questions. clutch person on a trivia night. In some in some categories, yes. In others, I'd rather run. That's <laughs> because an I'm, big, I'm not that good at all. You know, I, I, just, I know my limits. I know my limits. I'm you the go to drinker. On the, I like on it. The I like it. That, but it's an interesting thing. Uh, Thing that you bring up about that, because I remember my first time to China, I, I've always known the space differential just through studying of sure. cultural differences of the Asian popular culture and general populations. But when you go there and the amount of people that live in those countries and how close they have to be right. by nature of that, sure. that Billi- it just makes people. sense. Yeah. It just makes sense. So. That, that study of proxemics, that's what mm-hmm. that's called, you know, studying the distance. And I mm-hmm. do that in one of my classes is that I'm trying to d- discuss that co- different cultures have different sure. areas. Comforts. Uh-huh. So, you know, I I try I just start getting really close to a student just right. to see how <laughs> see how close you can get in without them. I'm like that's her personal space. But sure. if I would have been doing anything out of that, I would have been fine. So sometimes that's a cultural thing. You're with, you're with you know with my family, my other family lives in Chile, mm-hmm. and they give two they give kisses when you meet someone for the first time, and you're mm-hmm. hugging and so forth. So like you you gotta you gotta be comfortable with other people's comfort zones. Absolutely, and respect it because I mean live like when in Rome kind of thing. That, that's right. That that's right. I like it. So why are you passionate then about preserving and uncovering and discovering? Oh, man. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, that's at the heart of any archaeologist. Usually it's something like, oh, Indiana Jones or, you know, that goes down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but he wasn't really a great archaeologist, you know. He just I, was hot. He was hot. He was definitely <laughs> hot. I, I, I got no problem. I mean, that look is, is, is epic. It'll be epic until humans end. It'll mm-hmm. just that look. Um, but you know, I don't know that many archaeologists that go in a tomb and rip off a femur bone and make a torch out of it. That's, yeah. that's not the that's not the best that's not the best practice that you no, want out there at all. Not. It's not best not best practice. You're not going to get your research grant from that. That's for sure. So, but I, I think that he puts a little romance that you bring into. Um, but really, for me, the scouts we did a lot of Native American powwows. Mm-hmm. We went on mammoth digs, and all of a sudden, some just really hit. Um, but wrestling came in was really important in my life. Uh, and then I luckily got the scholarship to Canada. But once I got there, I went for business and I got two C's in business and I got B's in anthropology. Mm-hmm. And I said, something's not, maybe I'm Clicking. not a business mm-hmm. guy. Mm-hmm. And then I started down this trail, you know, and then I lived in Canada for the five years and did that. And then um, met my, my ex-wife and we lived many years in Chile and then mm-hmm. on Easter Island and then Australia and then New Zealand. And now I'm back in the shy, just trying to finish this PhD. That's cool. But it's just the, the, the trips are just, it's about that life. And I'm passionate because I think I, I'm very fortunate. Where is the craziest place you've ever been? Oh, man. And you can define crazy in yeah, any I way know. you'd like. I just think isolation is one thing mm. when you're, I think New Zealand to me is mm-hmm. just a place that it's is, beautiful. it's so wild. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's unbelievable. And the, the Maori culture. It's that, so neat, right? It, it, they're so, they're, you know, they had so many trees and resources and mm-hmm. they their carvings are so much so intricate. So one of my work at the Field Museum, uh, you know, in Chicago, we have this beautiful house, this beautiful house. It's called um, Rua Te Papuketu. Mm -hmm. It's just this meeting house. It's the only one in the United States and everything is carved. Every square inch is a carving. Wow. So you can just, you know, you take your shoes off before you go inside a a house, a fare. That's your respect. Keep, Keep the diseases and dirt outside and you come into your fresh, your fresh area. And there's carvings of all the ancestors on the wall. Oh. I want to go back to things like, what is your genealogy? Sure. In my classes, I always make them do kinship projects mm-hmm. in, in an anthropological way. I want them to know who their ancestors. When I ask the students, you know, um, who's your great, great grandma? Can anyone name a name? And it's silent. Wow. So I want to go back to that type of, and I think when I go to other cultures, I can see what my family, my mom's a genealogy, you need to go here, you need to go to Italy. Right. So recently we just came back from last a road trip in the Smoky Mountains. And I found my eight great grandfather, John Ownsby. It's his cabin. Wow. It's his cabin. So I never get to do my own archaeology. Yeah. Right. I'm always doing other people's archaeology. I'm always in, you know, on other islands, but this may be a chance that I can excavate my own ancestors. That's cool. So again, I I don't care what culture it is. 
I'm just interested. That's my currency where yours is, you know, sort of information and business and leadership. Mm -hmm. Mine's culture, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, I don't deal with gold or gas or water. I right. deal with my thing as culture. So I'm on, I'm part of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Okay. Have you heard of them? Sure. Them, so, them, yeah. yeah. So grandma has... Tra you know, traced our lineage all the way back to the American Revolution. And so we know everybody all the way. And so it's always been part of our lives and knowing that history and that type of thing. So it's, it's interesting to me to hear that people don't know sure. what's happening in their lives. What value do you think that brings to them? Well, I, I, it doesn't bring a value. They're, they're missing out on that value. That's mm -hmm. exactly the point mm -hmm. where they're not having that family. You know, they have more friends than family. I'm not saying all family is good. There's, you know, not all family relates. <laughs> they all get together. We don't live in that. You can undercover some crazy things in that cabin. Oh yeah. I, I, that's <laughs> what I'm excited. That's what I'm excited. I hope we get to get out there, but that's the whole thing about archaeology, about permits and you have to do it right. The native, the, the native people, the land, the Cherokee there, how do they feel about it? Because mm -hmm. those relationships were created back then as well. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but I guess the, the ultimate thing about for me about the passion, just to end this question, I know mm -hmm. we're, we're on this rant here. It's just like, it's just putting the known, the unknown to the known. Mm -hmm. Very simple. I learned that from the FBI on a, on a forensic course we went on to. And he's always trying to put things in the context from the known to the, the unknown to the known. Sorry, known to the unknown. You work what you, the data you have and try to get to that information you don't have. And you use all of those points of information. So oh. what you have in your system and apply it to what you don't have. Exactly. To get more. Nailed it. Nailed it. I think that's it. Because then you can use all those who, what, why, where, when facts that you have already gathered and start putting the story together. Then in science, what we use is another interpretive fr framework is theory. So in archaeology, there are multiple theories for thousands of years that people have been thinking about archaeology. Someone has created a theory to help frame out mm -hmm. what that discussion is about the past. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in archaeology, we have a unique thing that we do theory and practice and we do mm -hmm. a very, you know, it's a very important part of our work. So I try to use what I know, um, use the experience that I have from the techniques that I've been, you know, been learning for so many years, but it's always fun. Can you put those in a new context? Can you make two new studies? Can you think about how new technology could be used in archaeology? And that's where the trendsetters are at. Mm -hmm. You know, they just gave a, a woman a, bill, a million dollar grant because she was using things like Google Earth and finding archaeological sites digitally. Oh, wow. Wow. And now, I don't believe it was NASA. I forgot who actually gave, who signed the check. But that's an outstanding thing for even young archaeologists out there. To get excited get, on, get, on, get on Google and just scoop around. Find an area in your neighborhood. See what it is. You see mumps, a bump. You see a hill. Do you see a ravine? Do you mm -hmm. see any kind of work? And I think, uh, again, going back to the geography part of it, that's always fun about archaeology. See where you're at. Mm -hmm. you know? the, that's the, really neat. Yeah, the where, the where. So what was an unexpected aha moment for you? What's something that's come about that... Uh, yeah. So I'll just, my little note here, cause I got this one. I really want to highlight, uh, you know, it's finding out about the Polynesian motif. Mm. I've been to so many Polynesian islands, um, motif, like their dress. Yeah. Just, just a general, what it's like, it's, it's like a culture, but mm -hmm. like you can see it. It's, it's a thread and it's an everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's how they, they make things. It's how they cook. Uh, it's how detail oriented they are about m using everything possible uh, it's about not wasting, not saying? wasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About being a jack of multiple trades. Don't just become one thing. You know, we have that question. We ask our kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they have one thing right. sort of already pigeonholed yourself uh -huh. that you can't actually elongate what you can be. Mm -hmm. So you have these younger kids. Oh, I want to be a surfer. I want to be a gardener. I want to be a, a, a tour guide. I want, because they have this idea. They want to be good in a lot of things. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, with with the island, it's just such a unique place. Easter Island, as we, we get into mm -hmm. it, I, I'm, I do so much work there. And I think an aha moment is when I then went the first time to another island in Polynesia, to Tahiti, and I realized they have similar drawings and dress mm -hmm. as two islands. Now, wow. there's a lot of connection between them. Mm -hmm. They were probably been in connection for 800 years. Mm -hmm. But in there, you see if you, you know, the devil's in the details type stuff. If you really pay attention, there's a lot of similarity. However, they're from different islands. Therefore, they have their own... Their own trajectory. Mm -hmm. They're going to make their own pieces out of what they have. Mm -hmm. Tahiti, more trees, more biodiversity. So you see a, a different, but that motif is still there, that underlying motif. Mm -hmm. And then you go to New Zealand, which was probably the last island colonized by human beings. And then you have Australia, which is probably the first island colonized. Wow. So 50,000 years versus 1,000 years. Hmm. And those are completely two groups through DNA, through culture, but they're only separated by a three-hour flight. 
Interesting. So when you see, you can, you know, and that's why I have some of my mates, you know, they'll be like, oh, there's no difference between Australia and New Zealand. You're like, oh, wait a minute. Slow down. <laughs> it's like 50,000 years difference and completely two different cultural trajectories, mm -hmm. although they're from the Pacific. Right. So the Pacific is sort of macro and micro at the same time. You can, it depends where your microscope is at. Are you interested in the large macro mm -hmm. that you want to see everything or are you really dialing in to see that really focused detail. Mm -hmm. So you always got to be changing your, your microscope about life, about questions, about research. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something we always need to keep in mind. Change your microscope. Yeah, change your microscope. I love that. Can you share a funny story or a mistake, something crazy that's happened to you along the way? Yeah. So I always bring this one up and everyone laughs. So the first time that I was on Easter Island, we were doing a lot of hiking out to one of the sites that we were excavating. Mm -hmm. We were mostly excavating ovens because inside ovens, when you burn any type of material, um, we can, get the carbon, the, we can get carbon 14, anything that was alive. Mm -hmm. So burnt bone, uh, twig, mm -hmm. so forth, a shell. So we can get the dating from there. But we have to walk quite far every single day and got the sieves on our back and your lunch and you're out there for long days and the wind's just full on and we get ready for lunch. And the one of the groups that brought us out there, we all sit down and they, while we're excavating, they're fishing right off the sides. And they don't use a typical pole. They just use a little piece of PVC and they have line on it and they whip out the line and they just jig like this instead of having a pole and they're masters at it And you catch these little pan fish called PCs. They're beautiful. They're really good to eat So the first time that we're all in the, a lot of these people that I met in 2001 all of them are still my friends So we always go back to the story all the time So we're sitting down and we're getting and they have their fish and instead of having a fire where they just have like a grill They warm up rocks and put the fish right on the rocks. Mm -hmm. So actually you're, you're rock cooking it a little bit of lemon, a little bit of salt. Oh, beautiful. So they say, well, the, the first one, what we have to do is to take the fish off and we put it inside the fire. And that's for the tapuna. That's for the ancestors. So they can eat because they're hungry, too. They've been okay. helping us work. And they, you <laughs> right? know, they're, they're not the only ones working here. We got to feed them as well and fill their belly. But the second one goes to the invited guests. But you have to bite the head off. I went. Uh, well, I like sushi. I guess, I mean, this is, you know, whatever. Went in I, I Rome. Guess, I went in Rome as we went back into, went in Rapa Nui. I guess so, the, 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 these stories are, went in Rapa Nui. Um, and, uh, and I'm looking around and everyone's looking at me and the, all these kids are sitting around the fireside. And sure enough, knowing me, because I go for it, just took a huge bite. And everyone starts dying laughing. Because they weren't serious. And I'm like, I'm like, exactly. I'm like, do I have a piece of lemon on my face? Am I like, am I, what's wrong with my body? And they're like, we never eat the head like that. What are you doing? So I, you know, cause I literally won't eat crow, but I'll eat fish and I'm just struggling to get it down. Crunching this head. Crunching it. And head, bones then, and all. But from there, what I've learned is that you do eat everything on the head. You know, the eyeballs is very good. The, the little, little um there's like morsel parts on the back that you can just sort of eat that's a really good part a lot of protein there but i did not know how to do it i was so uncultured i was a swine uncultured swine <laughs> yeah. but then from there when i see some of these friends they'll always just give me the elbow and be like you want to fish just get that get the head off <laughs> or i'll see jokes people on the street trying to bite that head off and you know but that that made me realize i was dealing like humans going back to the cultural universals that are out there laughter and comedy as we know is is, mm -hmm. is the one of the most greatest cultural universals we have out there. And it was just showing me that this is a group my age. I probably would have done the same thing to them. Maybe mm -hmm. not made them eat a fish, maybe right. something a little nice, but uh, you know, we would have had that type of camaraderie and, and some of those are my friends still today. That's great. So I, I always think about how I look like a total fish eating idiot. And I'll remember that when, if we ever eat a meal together that, you know, to, to just let it go, warm. whatever's yeah, happening. Yeah. Just warn me, Dale, no heads. I, <laughs> no, I, will, I, no will heads. I will stay away. I will stay away. I will stay away. So share a bold action item or a, a takeaway or something our listeners can can walk away with. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this a lot. I, 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 wanted, I didn't want to say eight words when four will do. Mm -hmm. And I, I brought this word up a little bit earlier, and it's cultural relativity. Um, it's a term we use in anthropology quite frequently. It came from a gentleman named Dr. Franz Boas, who was sort of the godfather of anthropology. Um, he ended up starting the, the school project or the school at Columbia, which is one of the most prestigious anthropology departments. In short, he was from Chicago as well. He did some work there. But through his work, he came up with an idea that you want to see like other culture, you know, as they are, right? So, so difficult in the postmodern age that we don't see how right. things are, how they are. We see things as we are. Right. But it, you have to through really move your position all the time, asking those who, what, why, where, when questions. Uh, and what cultural relativity gives us is it helps us defeat ethnocentrism, mm -hmm. that our culture is better inherently because it's ours compared to yours. Right. 
Um, I think that, you know, you really have to get into it. You have to eat. You have to breathe. You have to listen. You have to challenge the xenophobia. Mm -hmm. You really do. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you're so unaware of it. You're like, God, what is this? I can't understand. I don't want to. You have to go with it. Sure. Get past that culture shock. Understand that that culture has things to teach you. Mm -hmm. Every culture in this world has, has something, something else to, to teach, teach something else. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I, that's one of my benefits is sort of like a cultural broker. My job is really to be, culture. you know, an, an, an outlet. And mm -hmm. I have all these different type of plugs that come my way. And I've got to change the energy to another culture. Mm -hmm. I can do that through language. I can do that through uh, writing, research. But I, I, I guess my speaking point is look up, as you just said, you know, cultural relativity and embrace it as a concept. Mm -hmm. Really embrace it. And I think we'll we'll get a it's a cheap thing to do. Yeah. You don't you don't need to put a lot of money into it. It's right. just how you go out every day. I said, what, instead of what will Jesus do, those WW, you know, uh -huh. what would cultural relativity do, you know, <laughs> and, and, and have a think about a situation like that. And people don't have to necessarily travel to do that. Now, if they That's have right. the opportunity to travel, then please, I always urge people to do that. But if not, there's so many subcultures in the United States and whatever country that is listening sitting and watching us and being a part, they can definitely go into their own backyard, dig up a little and say, how can I get involved in those subcultures as well? No, you nailed it. I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, in Chicago, we have over a hundred languages there. Mm -hmm. You know, we, the gentleman who drove us here and lifted us over here, he was giving us a nice little tour nice. and he was going through just the amount of Chinese individuals that have been here sure. in different groups. So like our American story is about migration. It's mm -hmm. about movement. Yeah. And especially during Native Native American Heritage Month, we've got to know we're just one more layer of this grand migration of humans. Mm -hmm. It's true. So if people want to get a hold of you or they want to go watch your shows or keep sure. track of your future journeys, where would they do that? So easily. I mean, on the History Channel page, they have all 10 episodes of Found. There it is. Looking good. Um, you know, we're, we're trying the, the found show was a great experience, you know, and, so that, cool. and that was actually coming back to my people in the United States and being able to talk with Americans about their stuff. Why mm -hmm. do we like stuff? <laughs> I got stuff in the shed and I got stuff over there. But some of the stuff is more valuable than other things. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially when money comes on to it. But for this show, instead of doing it like other shows that work with material culture, we were more interested in the people's story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I love. The who, what, why, where, when, how yeah. about of that piece. You know, where did you get it from? Why did you buy that? Where? Who is it from? What do you think it is? Mm -hmm. And these people have outrageous ideas to some people who know because they've done the research well. And then we come in and clean up some details. So found's one thing. The other one is just the, you know, the typical Facebook, Dale Simpson Jr. Uh, there's a tweeter, uh, a tweeter page. There's a Twitter page out there. I don't use that as much. Instagram. But, you know, you're, I'm out there you t to search and up we'll Dale Simpson. we'll post you on our, uh, our yeah. page, too. No, that would be outstanding. I, 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 and thank you so much for the time and, and everyone behind scenes as well to get us all organized. I, I think I got all my notes in there. But, <laughs> thank uh, you for being here and sharing yeah, your no, story. It was awesome. Thank you for everything. And if there's anything else you'd like me to bring up, I'm, I'm more than willing to. I'll hit you up on That's Twitter. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's go out yeah. to our shout out. My name is Willie Kenyon, and I'm listening to the Strategic Hot Box. Thank you to Willie Kenyon for sending us that shout out. I think that the beatbox didgeridoo is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. So if anybody has never checked out Willie Kenyon and his beatbox didgeridooing, then check him out for sure. Thank you again to Dale for being here with us on the Strategic Hot Box. Now it's the time. It's the time for kick ass. Here's your top five. Number one is listen to understand. Dale talked a lot about it to listen to understand in that cultural relativity to make sure we're asking questions and really understand what happened in the past, what happened to the people that are parts of different cultures, what happened in your organization, what happened if you go into a new position, what happened with the leadership prior to that, anything you can do to listen to really understand. Number two is to be curious, live in curiosity, live in learning, always want to absorb the next, be curious about the future, be curious about the past, and it'll help you have that thirst for knowledge. Number three is to respect the legacy. So it's built that foundation of knowledge, built that foundation that we are living on now. So whether it's all those things, all the human beings that you're saying, the, the layers of life and, that came before us, and just the legacy of the foundation, the organization that came before us as well. So respect the legacy. 
Number four is apply that learning to the future. I think that it's impossible to make good plans for the future until we've done number one through four here, listening to understand, being curious, respecting that legacy, and then, of course, keeping your eye on the prize. Mm. And number five is enjoy the discovery. There is nothing more exciting about life than learning and discovering and just finding out all those, just uncovering something about another human being, about a person you love, a thing you love, and just living in that moment of magic of that discovery. That's exciting stuff. Enjoy it when it happens. That's your top five kick ass. Thank you again to Dale for being here. It was so fun to talk about making history relevant. Get out there and check him out on the History Channel Found or on our website. Of course, you can find all the info, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter was, yeah. at Brandy Love or at the Strategic Hot Box. And of course, you can head out to the strategichotbox.com and get any info anytime. Until next time, get out there and kick some ass.